This is When I Was Puerto Rican by Esmeralda Santiago. Grand Avenue in Williamsburg was the broadest street I'd ever seen. It was flanked by three and four story apartment buildings, the first floors of which contained stores where you could buy anything. Most of these stores were also run by Jewish people, but they didn't speak Spanish like the ones in La Marqueta. They were less friendly, too, unwilling to negotiate prices. On Graham Avenue, there were special restaurants where my where mommy said Jewish people ate. They were called delis, and there were foreign symbols in the windows, and underneath them the word kosher. I knew mommy wouldn't know what it meant, so I didn't bother asking. I imagined it was a delicacy that only Jewish people ate, which is why their restaurants so prominently let them know you could get it there. We didn't go into the delis because mommy said they didn't like Puerto Ricans there. Instead, she took me to eat pizza. It's Italian, she said. Do Italians like Puerto Ricans? I asked as I bit into hot cheese and tomato sauce that burned the tip of my tongue. They're more like us than Jewish people are, she said, which wasn't an answer. In Puerto Rico, the only foreigners I'd been aware of were Americanos. In two days in Brooklyn, I had already encountered Jewish people and now Italians. There were another group of people Mommy had pointed out to me, Morenos. But they weren't foreigners because they were American. They were black, but they didn't look like Puerto Rican Negros. They dressed like Americanos, but walked with a jaunty hop that made them look as if they were dancing down the street. Only, their hips were not as loose as Puerto Rican men were, men's were. According to Mommy, they too lived in their own neighborhoods, frequented their own restaurants, and didn't like Puerto Ricans. How come, I wondered, since in Puerto Rico, all of the people I had ever met were either black or had a black relative somewhere in their family. I would have thought Morenos would like us, since so many of us look like them. They think we're taking their jobs. Are we? There's enough work in the United States for everybody, Mommy said. But some people think some work is beneath them. Me? If I have to crawl on all fours to earn a living, I'll do it. I'm not proud that way. I couldn't imagine what kind of work required crawling on all fours, although I remembered Mommy scrubbing the floor that way, so it seemed she was talking about housework. Although, according to her, she wouldn't be too proud to clean other people's houses. I hoped she wouldn't have to do it. It would be too embarrassing to come all the way from Puerto Rico so she could be somebody's maid. The first day of school, Mommy walked me to a stone building that loomed over Graham Avenue, its concrete yard enclosed by an iron fence with spikes at the top. The front steps were wide but shallow and led up to a set of heavy double doors. It slammed shut behind us as we walked down the shiny corridor. <clears throat> I clutched my eighth grade report card, filled with A's and B's, but and Mommy had my birth certificate. At the front office, we were met by Mr. Grant, a droopy gentleman with thick glasses and a kind smile who spoke no Spanish. He gave Mommy a form to fill, not, fill out. I knew most of the words in the squares, we were to fill in name, address, city, state, and occupation. We gave it to Mr. Grant, who reviewed it, looked at my birth certificate, studied my report card, then wrote on the top form, 718. Don Julio had told me that if students didn't speak English, the schools in Brooklyn would keep them back one grade until they learned it. Seven gray? I asked Mr. Grant, pointing at his big numbers, and he nodded. I know go on seventh grade. I eighth grade. I teenager. You don't speak English, he said. You have to go to seventh grade while you're learning. I have A's in school Puerto Rico. I learn good. I know seventh grade girl. Mommy stared at me, not understanding, but knowing I was being rude to an adult. What's going on? She asked me in Spanish. I told her they wanted to send me back one grade and I would not have it. This was probably the first rebellious act she had seen from me outside my usual mouthiness within the family. Nagy, leave it alone. Those are the rules, she said, a warning in her voice. I don't care what their rules say, I answered. I'm not going back to seventh grade. I can do the work. I'm not stupid. Mommy looked at Mr. Grant, who stared at her as if expecting her to do something about me. 
She smiled and shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Grant, I said, seizing the moment, I go eighth grade, six months. If I don't learn English, I go seventh grade, okay? That's not the way we do things here, he said, hesitating. I good student. I learn quick. You see notes. I pointed to the A's in my report card. I passed seventh grade. So we made a deal. You have until Christmas, he said. I'll be checking on your progress. He scratched out 718 and wrote in 823. He wrote something on a piece of paper, sealed it inside an envelope, and gave it to me. Your teacher is Miss Brown. Take this note upstairs to her. Your mother can go, he said, and disappeared into his office. Wow, Mommy said. You can speak English. I was so proud of myself, I almost burst. In Puerto Rico, if I'd been that pushy, I would have been called mal educada by the Mr. Grant equivalent and sent home with a note to my mother. But here it was my teacher who was getting the note. I got what I wanted, and my mother was sent home. I could find my way after school, I said to Mommy. You don't have to come get me. Are you sure? Don't worry, I said. I'll be all right. I walked down the black tiled hallway, past many doors that were half glass, each one labeled with a room number in neat black lettering. Other students stared at me, tried to get my attention, or pointedly ignored me. I kept walking as if I knew where I was going, heading for the sign that said stairs with an arrow pointing up. When I reached the end of the hall and looked back, Mommy was still standing at the front door, watching me, a worried expression on her face. I waved, and she waved back. All of a sudden, I was afraid that I was about to make a fool of myself and end up in seventh grade in the middle of the school year. Having to fall back would be worse than just accepting my fate now and hopping forward if I proved to be as good a student as I had convinced Mr. Grant I was. What have I done? I kicked myself at the back of my right shoe. Much to the surprise of the fellow walking behind me, who laughed uproariously, as if I had meant it as a joke. Miss Brown's was the learning disabled class, where the administration sent kids with all sorts of problems, none of which, from which, from what I could see, had anything to do with their ability to learn, but more with their willingness to do so. They were an unruly group, those who came to class anyway. Half of them never showed up, or when they did, they slept through the lesson or nodded off in the middle of Miss Brown's carefully parsed sentences. We were outcasts in a school where the smartest eighth graders were in the 8-1 room, each subsequent drop in number indicating one notch less smarts. If your class was in the low double digits, 8-10, for instance, you were smart but not a pinhead. Once you got to the teens, your intelligence was in question, especially as the numbers rose to the high teens, and then there were the 20s. I was placed in 823, where the dumbest, most undesirable people were placed. My class was, in some ways, the equivalent of 7th grade, perhaps even 6th or 5th. Miss Brown, the homeroom teacher, who also taught English composition, was a young black woman who wore sweat pads under her arms. The strings holding them in place sometimes slipped outside the short-sleeved sleeves of her well-pressed white shirts, and she had to turn her back to us in order to adjust them. She was very pretty, with almond eyes and a hairdo that was flat and straight at the top, then dipped into tight curls at the ends. Her fingers were well manicured, the nails painted pale pink with white tips. She taught English composition as if everyone cared about it, which I found appealing. After the first week, she moved me from the back of the room <clears throat> to the front seat by her desk, and after that, it felt as if she were teaching me alone. We never spoke, except when I went up to the blackboard. Esmeralda, she called in a musical tone, would you please come up and mark the prepositional phrase? In her class, I learned to recognize the structure of the English language and to draft the parts of a sentence by the position of the words relative to pronouns and prepositions without knowing exactly what the whole thing meant. The school was huge and noisy. There was a social order that at first I didn't understand, but kept bumping into. 
Girls and boys who wore matching cardigans walked down the halls hand in hand, sometimes stopping behind lockers to kiss and fondle each other. They were Americanos and belonged in the homerooms with the low numbers. Another group of girls wore heavy makeup, hitched their skirts above the knees, opened one extra button on their blouses, and teased their hair into enormous bouffants held solid with spray. In the morning, they took over the girls' bathroom, where they dragged on cigarettes as they did their hair until the air was unbreathable, thick with smoke and hairspray. The one time I entered the bathroom before classes, they chased me out with insults and rough shoves. Those bold girls with the hair and makeup and short skirts, I soon found out, were Italian. The Italians all sat together on one side of the cafeteria, the blacks on another. The two groups hated each other more than they hated Puerto Ricans. At least once a week, there was a fight between an Italian and a Moreno. Even in the bathroom, in the schoolyard, or in an abandoned lot near the school. A no-man's land that divided the neighborhoods and kept them apart on weekends. The black girls had their own style. Not for them, the big, poofy hair of the Italians. Their hair was straightened and curled at the tips like Miss Brown's, or pulled up into a twist at the back with wispy curls and straw straight bangs over Cleopatra eyes. Their skirts were also short, except it didn't look like they hitched them up when their mothers weren't looking. They came that way. They had strong, shapely legs and wore knee socks with heavy lace-up shoes that became lethal weapons in fights. It was rumored that the Italians carried knives, even the girls, and that the Morenos had brass knuckles in their pockets and steel toes in their heavy shoes. I stayed away from both groups. Afraid that if I befriended an Italian, I'd get beat up by a morena, or vice versa. There were two kinds of Puerto Ricans in the school. The newly arrived, like myself, and the ones born in Brooklyn of Puerto Rican parents. The two types didn't mix. The Brooklyn Puerto Ricans spoke English, and often no Spanish at all. To them, Puerto Rico was the place where their grandparents lived a place they visited on school and summer vacations, a place which they complained was backward and mosquito-ridden. Those of us for whom Puerto Rico was still a recent memory were also split into two groups, the ones who longed for the island and the ones who wanted to forget it as soon as possible. I felt disloyal for wanting to learn English, for liking pizza, for studying the girls with big hair and trying out their styles at home, locked in the bathroom where no one could watch. I practiced walking with the peculiar little hop of the morenas, but I felt as if I were limping. I didn't feel comfortable with the newly arrived Puerto Ricans who stuck together in suspicious little groups, criticizing everyone, afraid of everything. And I was not accepted by the Brooklyn Puerto Ricans who held the secret of coolness. They walked the halls between the Italians and the morenos, Neither one nor the other, but looking and acting like a combination of both, depending on the texture of their hair and the shade of their skin, their makeup, and the way they walked down the hall. One day, I came home from school to find all our things packed and Mommy waiting. Your sisters and brothers are coming, she said. We're moving to a bigger place. Tata and I helped her drag the stuff out to the sidewalk. After it was all together... Mommy walked to Graham Avenue and found a cab. The driver helped us load the trunk, the front seat, and the floor of the rear seat until we were sitting on our bundles for the short ride to Verrett Street, on the other side of the projects. I'd read about, but had never seen the projects. Just that weekend, a man had taken a nine-year-old girl to the roof of one of the buildings, raped her, and thrown her over the side, down 21 stories. El Diario... The Spanish newspaper had covered the story in detail and featured a picture of the building facing Bushwick Avenue with a dotted line from where the girl was thrown to where she fell. But Mommy didn't talk about that. She said that the new apartment was much bigger and that Tata would be living with us so she could take care of us while Mommy worked. I wouldn't have to change schools. The air was getting cooler, and before Delsa, Norma, Hector and Alicia came, Mommy and I went shopping for coats and sweaters in a second-hand store. 
so that the kids wouldn't get sick their first week in Brooklyn. We also brought a couch and two matching chairs, two big beds, a shifaro with a mirror and two folding cots. Mommy let me pick out the stuff, and I acted like a rich lady, choosing the most ornate pieces I spotted with gold curly cues painted on the wood, intricate carving, and fancy poles on the drawers. Our new place was a railroad-style apartment on the second floor of a three-story house. There were four rooms from front to back, one leading into the other. The living room facing Verrett Street, then our bedroom, then Tata's room, then the kitchen. The tub was in the bathroom this time. The kitchen was big enough for a table and chairs, two folding racks for drying clothes, washed by hand in the sink, and a stack of shelves for groceries. The fireplace in the living room, with its plain marble mantle, was blocked off, and we put Tata's television in front of it. The wood floors were dark and difficult to clean because the mop strings caught in splinters and cracks. The ceilings were high, but no cherubs danced around the garlands, and no braided molding curled around the borders. On October 7, 1961, Don Julio, Mami, and I went to the airport to pick up Delsa, Norma, Hector, and Alicia. Papi had sent them unescorted with Delsa in charge. The first thing I noticed was that her face was pinched and tired. At 11 years old, <clears throat> Delsa looked like a woman, but her tiny body was still that of a little girl. In the taxi on the way home, I couldn't stop talking. Telling Delsa about the broad streets, the big schools, the subway train, I told her about the Italians, the Morenos, the Jewish. I described how, in Brooklyn, you didn't have to wear uniforms to school, but on Friday, there was a class called Assembly in a big auditorium, and all the kids had to wear white shirts. Tata prepared a feast, asofal, Drake's cakes, Coke, and potato chips. The kids were wide-eyed and scared. I wondered if that's the way I looked two months earlier and hoped that if I had, it had worn off by now. All my brothers and sisters were sent back one grade so they could learn English, so I walked to the junior high school alone. My brothers and sisters went together to the elementary school on Bushwick Avenue. Mommy insisted that I take the long way to school not cut across the projects, but I did it once because I wanted to find the spot where the little girl had fallen. I wondered if she had been dead when she fell or if she had still been alive, whether she had screamed or whether when you fall from such a great height you lose air and can't make a sound, as sometimes happened to me if I ran too fast. The broad concrete walkways curved in and out, in and around the massive yellow buildings it rose taller than anything else in the neighborhood. What would happen to the people who lived there in case of fire? I imagined people jumping out the windows, raining down onto the broad sidewalks and cement basketball courts. The walls of the projects and the buildings nearby were covered with graffiti. I didn't know what like a motherfucker meant after someone's name. Sometimes the phrase would be abbreviated, Slick LMAF or Papote LMAF. I had heard kids say shit when something annoyed them. But when I tried it at home, Mommy yelled at me for saying a bad word. I didn't know how she knew what it meant. And I didn't, and she wouldn't tell me. Mommy, can I get a bra? What for? You don't have anything up there, she laughed. Yes, I do. Look, all the girls in my school's you don't need a bra until you are a senorita, so don't ask again. Mommy, I said a couple weeks later, as she changed out of her work clothes, I'm going to need that bra now. What? She stared at me, ready to argue, and then her face lit up. Really? When? I noticed it when I came home from school. Do you know what to do? Si. Who told you? Her face was a jumble of disappointment and suspicion. We had a class about it in school. Ah, okay then. Come with me and I'll show you where I keep my Kotex. We walked hand in hand to the bathroom. Tata was in the kitchen. Guess what, Tata? Mommy said. 
Maggie is a senorita. Hey, that's wonderful. She hugged and kissed me. She held me at arm's length, her eyes serious. Her voice dropped to a grave tone. Remember, when you're like that, don't eat pineapples. Why not? It curdles the blood. In the bathroom, Mommy showed me her Kotex hidden on a high shelf under towels. When you change them, wrap the soiled ones in toilet paper so no one can see. Do you want me to help you put the first one on? No! Just asking. She left me alone, but I could hear her and Tata giggling in the kitchen. The next day, Mommy brought me a couple of white cotton bras with tiny blue flowers between the cups. These are from the factory, she said. I sewed the cups myself. While Mommy worked in Manhattan, Tata watched us. As the days grew shorter and the air cooler, she began drinking wine or beer earlier in the day, so it wasn't unusual for us to come home from school and find her drunk, although she still would make supper and insist that we eat a full helping of whatever she had cooked. My bones hurt, she said. The beer makes the pain less. Her blood had never thickened, Don Julio explained, and she had developed arthritis. Tata had been in Brooklyn more than 15 years, and if her blood hadn't thickened by then, I worried about how long it would take. We complained about being cold all the time, but Mommy couldn't do anything about it. She called El Lanlor from work so that he would turn the heat on in the building, but he never did. On the coldest days, Tata lit up the oven and the four burners on the stove. She left the oven door open, and we took turns sitting in front of it, warming up. One evening, as we all sat grouped around the stove, I told the kids a fairy tale I'd just read. Don Julio crouched in the corner listening. Like my sisters and brothers, he frequently interrupted the story to ask for more details. Like, what color was the prince's horse? And what did the fairy godmother wear? The more they asked, the more elaborate the story became, until by the end it was nothing like what I had started with. When it was over, they applauded. Tell us another one, Hector demanded. Tomorrow. If you tell it now, Don Julio said, I'll give you a dime. For a dime, I'll tell you a story, Delsa jumped in. I'll do it for a nickel, challenged Norma. Everyone quiet. It's my dime. I'll tell it. Edna and Raymond huddled closer to my feet. Delsa and Normal, Norma, who had sprawled on the linoleum floor wrapped in a blanket, argued about who had to move to give the other more room. Let me get another beer, Don Julio said, he, and he lumbered to the refrigerator. Tata lay on her bed in the next room. Get me one too, will you, Julio? She called out. Negi, talk louder so I can hear the story. Would anyone like some hot chocolate and bread with butter? Mommy offered. There was a chorus of, me, 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 me. Do you want me to tell the story or not? Yes, of course, Don Julio said. Let's just get comfortable. Go ahead and start, Negi, Mommy said. The milk takes a while to heat up and I have to melt the chocolate bar first. All right. Once upon a time. One minute, Alicia interrupted. I have to go to the bathroom. Don't nobody take my place, she warned. The fluorescent fixture overhead buzzed and flickered, its blue-gray light giving our faces an ashen color, as if we were dead. Don Julio's face looked menacing in that light, although his small green eyes and childlike smile were reassuring. My sisters and brothers were huddled together, as close to the open oven door as they could manage without getting in Mommy's way as she melted a bar of chocolate Cortez and kept adjusting the flame on the pan of milk so that it wouldn't boil over. The room looked larger when we were all together like this, leaning toward the warmth. The walls seemed higher and steeper, the ceilings further away. The sounds of the city, its constant roar, disappeared behind the clink of Mommy's spoon stirring chocolate the soft, even breathing of my sisters and brothers, the light thump each time Don Julio set his beer can on the Formica table. 
Brooklyn became just a memory as I led them to a distant land where palaces shimmered against deserts, sand, and paupers became princes with the whoosh of a magic wand. Every night that first winter, we gathered in the kitchen around the oven door, and I embellished fairy tales in which the main characters were named after my brothers and sisters, who, no matter how big the odds, <clears throat> always triumphed and always went on to live happily ever after. Come, kids, come look, it's snowing. Mommy opened the window wide and stuck out her hand. And let the snow collect on her palm. It looked like coconut flakes. She grated for arroz con dulce. The moment it fell into our hands, it melted into shimmering puddles which we licked in slurpy gulps. Can we go down and play in it, Mommy? We begged, but she would not let us because it was dark out and the streets were never safe after dark. We filled glasses with the snow, clumping on the fire escape, then poured tamarind syrup on it to make piraguas Brooklyn style. But they tasted nothing like the real thing because the snow melted in the cup and we missed the crunchy bits of ice we were used to. The next day, schools were closed, and we went out bundled in all the clothes Mommy could get on us. The world was clean and crisp. A white blanket spread over the neighborhood, covering garbage cans and the hulks of abandoned cars, so that the street looked fresh and full of promise. When schools opened again, kids ran in groups and made snowballs, which they then threw at passing buses or at each other. But as beautiful as it was, and as cheerful as it made everyone for a while, in Brooklyn, even snow was dangerous. One of my classmates had to be rushed to the hospital when another kid hit him in the eye with a rock tightly packed inside a clump of snow. Every day after school, I went to the library and took out as many children's books as I was allowed. I figured that, if American children learn English through books, so could I, even if I was starting later. I studied the bright illustrations and learned the words for the unfamiliar objects of our new life in the United States. A is for apple, B is for bear, C is for cabbage. As my vocabulary grew, I moved my large print I moved to large print chapter books. Mommy bought me an English to English dictionary because that way, when I looked up a word, I would be learning others. By my fourth month in Brooklyn, I could read and write English much better than I could speak it. And at midterms, I stunned the teachers by scoring high in English, history, and social studies. During the January assembly, Mr. Grant announced the names of the kids who had received high marks in each class. My name was called out three times. I became a different person to the other eighth graders. I was still in 823, but they knew, and I knew, that I didn't belong there.